you may be wondering why am I seated in front of my bed and in front of this harsh lighting well if you look closely you see that there's a construction site outside my window you know or if I just moved away a bit and well today we'll be talking about migrant workers Singapore is heavily dependent on migrant workers and let me elaborate just a little bit about that I promise there won't be any history lessons today so in the 70s and 80s, as Singapore's education system got better and Singaporeans got more well-educated in general, it became evident that Singaporeans were going to shun away from labourers' work, such as construction work. This would have led to a labour shortage, and so Singapore began to look outwards to source for migrant workers. And this came from places such as parts of Southeast Asia, South Asia, and China, among many other places. A large part of these migrant workers actually work in the construction sector and so we're going to focus on them today. So unless you are living under a rock, you will know that last year, the migrant workers became the talk of the town when the number of COVID-19 cases spiked in the dormitories. People began to ask, how did you get out of control so quickly? It was also during this period when many realised how bad the living conditions were for these migrant workers. I actually did a video back then and here's a short segment to show you what I really mean. The building code states that a bunk for 20 men needs to be at least 90 square meters. However, to put that into perspective, a four-room HDB flat in Singapore is also 90 square meters. This means that an area meant for a family of four to five is now packed with 12 to 20 men. And this means that social distancing is an issue as space is very limited and hygiene can also be called into question. Well, one year on, many will assume that the conditions would have gotten better for the migrant workers. Unfortunately, this is far from the truth. So I went online looking for articles and found these by Transient Workers Count 2, which is a non-profit organisation dedicated to improving the lives of migrant workers. In this interview, which is done with two migrant workers in December 2020, both workers talk about the poor living conditions that they are put in. So for the first worker, he estimates that there are about 200 residents where he stays at and 100 men per floor. So with only 6 toilets, that's a ratio of 17 men per toilet. For the second worker, he states that 22 of them are cramped into a room of only 15 bunk beds. Both workers also talk about poor ventilation, either windows breaking or having no windows and only vents that are only 700 millimeters wide. In terms of food, one of the workers talk about not being allowed to cook there and hence they had to go out to buy, while the other states that the food provided is just bad. As I was looking through the website, I found many more articles talking about the issues migrant workers are facing in Singapore, and one of them is the long working hours. So, for some context, when the pandemic hit last year, a series of trends or events occurred. Many workers actually went home, and Singapore also tightened our borders to curb the spread of the virus. This led to a labour shortage, and together with the impact of the circuit breaker, many of the construction projects that we see right now are actually behind time and are delayed. To mitigate the impact of the slow progress, many companies actually make their workers work beyond usual hours and weekends are also used as well and this is actually what I've been seeing from my house my housing estate for the past few months um, while I do not know if these workers are working in shifts or whether they are overworked it is safe to say that there are many other companies out there that are overworking their employees so back to the articles this starts off with the Employment Act which states that an employee shall not be permitted to work overtime for more than 72 hours a month. And it goes on to state that this migrant worker has worked overtime for more than 72 hours that month. And it goes on to state how the employer has mistreated or overworked this migrant worker. Some may think that this was due to COVID-19 restrictions and all, but this is not the case because in this other article from 2017, it was reported that more than two-thirds of construction workers actually work beyond this 72 hours limit. And because of the amount of work that they are putting in, they are also only getting the bare minimum of rest. And as a result, many of them are only getting about seven hours of sleep in contrast to the amount of laborers' work that they have to put in each day. 
there are actually so many other issues to talk about, but let's just jump into the last one for the day. In late April of this year, a light lorry carrying 17 migrant workers collided with a stationary tipper truck. This resulted in the death of two migrant workers. In the immediate aftermath of the accident, people began to wonder, why are we transporting our workers this way? You know, evidently, sitting at the back of the light lorry isn't safe at all. The only safety features that they have is the higher railings and the canopy. There isn't seat belts or any other safety features to really protect the workers if an accident were to occur. Notably, in January 2010, the law then states that new light lorries had to be fitted with higher railings and canopies, while existing light lorries back then had till September 2012 to do so. However, following a fatal accident involving a light lorry that resulted in the death of three migrant workers, this deadline was brought forward to January 2011. So, while the government is implementing policies to protect the workers, there's also a lot of catching up for them to do. Back to the current situation, I think the question in many people's mind will be, if we are uncomfortable travelling with our family members at the back of a light lorry, why are we making our workers do so? Companies may suggest that it's not economical or cost-effective to cater a bus, even a small bus, to bring their workers from their place of accommodation to their workplace. Clearly, this is yet another example of people putting profits before human lives. And if you've been following this video, you'll know that this is not something new in this industry. Let us sidetrack for a while and let me tell you a story. So I was from a junior college and back in JC, we had to do this subject called project work. In essence, we had to do a project, we had to identify an issue and come up with solutions targeted at that issue. My group back then decided to focus on migrant workers, specifically how Singaporeans were treating them or how we were viewing them. So actually, across many groups, actually many groups um, did something related to migrant workers. And across the years, it's always a recurring theme. And so the point that I'm trying to make is that we've always known that they are vulnerable. The only thing that the COVID-19 pandemic did was to put them on the headlines again. We've always seen initiatives from the community or individuals giving them food, fruits and drinks. These are all really good initiatives. But as a society, we haven't been asking the right questions. Because the only question that we should be asking is, why are they vulnerable? So I actually have been reading this book, actually I just finished this book. It's called uh, This is What Inequality Looks Like by Professor Tio Yo Yen. So while she doesn't talk about the migrant workers in her book, one thing that I've learned from this book is that many of the issues we see in Singapore are actually systemic. In a sense that, you know, the issues faced by the migrant workers are actually a result of the system they are, they are in. And what this means to me is that we have the means to actually solve them. We have the solutions to actually improve their lives. It's quite ironic that Singapore, a first world nation, we are a first world country, one that aims to be first in almost everything that we do, is treating our migrant workers this way. And you know, this is not something that's controversial. It's probably one of the least controversial thing that we have to think about. If we can't guarantee the basic right of the migrant workers here, the right to being able to travel from places to places safely, the right to a proper accommodation, the right to a safe workplace, then I think we really have to try harder because this is not showing of a country that is of world-class status. 